a great favor that Herb does, uh, does us to put this together because it raised the uh, questions earlier on in the week. So okay. I thank you dearly well, for this and it's... Uh, 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 okay, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to give another talk. What I was commissioned to do is to talk about sand balls in my book. And that's what I'm going to do. So, um, it will I'm not explicitly direct um, addressing questions uh, that came up in this meeting. Um, so this is from our book, Cooperative Species, Human Reciprocity and its Evolution. Um, this is what the cover looks like. Something like that. It's pretty good than that. Um, so as you see, it's about the evolution of human, uh, of our species. I have another paper on this that's more recent that does not cover anything about altruism or cooperation, but rather deals with the development of political, human political structure, and especially hypercognition and language. Uh, and that's with Caroline Schenk and Carl Berman, uh, Berman, it's on my website. Uh, so I won't talk about that. This is basically about why humans are uh, uh, altruistic in some sense. So under two propositions, people cooperate not only for self-interested reasons, but also because they're concerned about the well-being of others, they try to uphold social norms, and they value behaving ethically for its own sake. So there's three separate issues here. Um, people punish those who free ride on the cooperative behavior of others, even when they cannot expect to gain anything from it, other than the pleasure of hurting someone who has done wrong. Now, this is very important. I, I probably shouldn't spend too much time on this, but let me stress. If you read a sociology textbook, <coughs> you never see revenge. There's no theory of human revenge or retaliation. It's just not there. And yet, it's one of the two basic human emotions, the most important human emotions, love and revenge. Notice if you go to the movies, there are two basic kinds of movies. There are the chick flicks, the love movies, where people fall in love and they, uh, so they fall out, they get together and this stuff. And the second is the revenge movies, the Texas Chainsaw Massacres, the... Um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's family is hurt in the first minute, and this next hour and a half, he's killing everybody in sight. And people go to the movies and they come out. That was wonderful. I, it's so, all these people were murdered, you know. <laughs> right in front. If only I could do that every day and do people I don't like, you know. I'm, I'm overstating, of course. My point is, this is a, such a basic human emotion, and the social sciences until the work that we've been doing in the past 15 years or so, they treated it as non-existent or, at, or a patho pathological. Wanting revenge is pathological. Well, it isn't pathological. It's actually human logic. Um, now, oh, how, how did it go from the first to the last? <laughs> you did the same oh, thing. I did the same thing. I, I pushed N instead of, yeah, it's good for me. Um, now, the second is we have these moral sentiments because our ancestor li ancestors lived in environments in which groups of individuals who were predisposed to cooperate and uphold ethical norms tended to survive and expand relative to other groups. This is obvious for that, obviously. Thereby proliferating these pro-social motivations, both culturally and genetically. And as I said in my first talk, Culture and genes are interrelated according to the theory of gene culture co-evolution. Um, so our genes are the genes that were most uh, convivial to the particular cultures that arose in our evolutionary past. Genes are effective culture. Now, two kinds of cooperation, mutualistic, i.e. an activity that confers net benefits both on the actor and others. Um, but it can all, cooperation can also impose net costs upon the individual. We say that it's altruistic. Um, altruistic cooperation will not be undertaken by an individual whose motives were entirely self-regarding. That's obvious. A lot of this is obvious. I'm just saying what's in that book. We've gone over some of it, a lot of it. Um, 
Uh, the evolution of cooperation is mutualistic, or, and this is not mutualistic, kin altruism, which is help your relatives. It's very common in, in uh, other species and in humans. Uh, other than that, sacrifice on behalf of close relatives, these are, easy, I'm sorry, these are easily explained by natural selection, according to inclusive fitness theory and common sense. To help you not make your others like you, you're going to spread the genes and gene complexes that are like yours. Um, because such behaviors help proliferate one's genes irrespective of whose body they're in, including the genes that induce the healthy behavior. This is called inclusive fitness theory. Um, there's also reciprocal altruism, which is really b a bad name. Robert Trivers made it up a long time ago, which is tit for tat. And there's a lot of that. Or actually, believe it or not, let me go back to that. Believe it or not, humans are the only species that are, have been demonstrated to uh, play the reciprocal altruism game. They're the only species that has been demonstrated to do that. Uh, regularly. Um, there are other people talk about, about look, vampire bats that share blood, but it's not reciprocal altruism. They're closely related and they don't keep count of who gives to whom. Um, and reciprocal altruism is really long-run mutualism. It's enlightened long-run mutualism. Um, these explain many forms of human cooperation, many, many forms particularly those occurring in close kin or in very small groups or where there's a lot of repetition, so you're dealing with people over and over. And I would add, when there's a good reputation effect, all of them. But they fail to explain at least two things. One, it takes place in large groups of non-kin, where people don't know each other. They're not related. Um, and it occurs in interactions where there's no repetition, so you can't form uh, reputations. Um, also, where there's complete anonymity, people behave prosocial. That's one of the things we found early in our work, um, that uh, people basically take their, their social values and their ethics into the laboratory, even when nobody's watching except themselves. Um, only a model with social preferences that motivate them, by social preferences I mean Either they like to uphold norms, or they care about other people, or they, they, they value virtues for their own sake, like honesty, trustworthiness, loyalty, consideration, etc. Um, so the question is, how do these social preferences arrive? And that's what we are, are uh, trying to show in our book. Now, what we try to show is a plausible story about the origin of these social preferences. We certainly can't prove that this is a correct story, but we've tried to use all of the empirical data that was available to us to make a story that is not wrong somehow, and that is also logical and plausible. This is subject to change when we get new anthropological information, neurological, paleontological. These are subject to change. But it's the best story we've been able to put together. Um, so, we started out, um, we branched off from the, from the um, apes uh, many millions of years ago because apes, all the apes are herbivores or frugivores. They eat fruit or leaves. The early hominids were scavengers that, ate, that, that, um, scav that uh, chased away predators uh, uh, like, like lions and tigers, um, and ate uh, the meat of large mammals. So uh, we were, uh, we were om omnivores, hunter-gatherers. But the hunters at first were scavengers. Um, now, the thing, first thing about, let me go back to this, the first thing, the most important thing about this is to hunt, is a collective endeavor. It's a collaborative endeavor. That is, people have to work together in order to, to hunt, you have to hunt together. And to um, 
plan where you're going to go the next day to hunt, you have to plan together. And to carry it out, you have to coordinate your behaviors. So there's a lot of social interaction going on there. Moreover, when you get to the point of actually cook, having fire and cooking, and this, by the way, is more in, our, in my later paper, um, if you have a large animal, if you see any other species with a large, large, uh, the big predators, when they kill someone, they all get in there and eat whatever they can. No such thing as fairness. No need for it. Everybody eats what he can. But if you cook meat, a large uh, animal, you have to drag it back to where the fire is. You have to cook it for many hours. And in order to avoid um, conflict, you develop rules of fairness for how you divide the kill. And these are very well developed in modern hunter-gatherer societies. Modern hunter-gatherers fight about lots of stuff, mostly marital, women, and this and that. But they don't fight about food almost everywhere, anywhere. Um, so, and the second thing is that humans are, and this is a beautiful story, if I only have time to go into it, is that humans develop cooperative child rearing. Why? Because they, the, they raise their children around the fires. The fires are kept the, the predators away from them and allow them to sleep on the ground without climbing into trees. So they raise the children around the fire collectively, and a few women every day would take care of the children, and the others would go out and, and, and gather, and, uh, etc. Every known species where there's collective child rearing is very social. Okay, and that's even among apes, among, among monkeys. There are some, some monkeys that are very uh, child reared together, each, and they are pro-social. The others where they don't do that, they're not pro-social. So humans evolve with two forms of uh, life, uh, of fit, fitness enhancing behavior, hunting and child rearing, they were highly pro-social. Um, so groups that fostered cooperation in hunting, child rearing, and punishing, by the way, also. That is, punishment is not individual, the way you see it like in, in the experiments, you know, each individual punishes separately. In the real world, um, around the fire every night, people decide who screwed up, and they delegate people to punish them. Okay, this is standard today in hunter-gatherer societies. Rob Boyd, Sam Bowles, and I have an article in, uh, uh, in Science that shows that this is uh, a viable analytical mechanism, sharing punishment rather than individually. Um, so, uh, they have to cooperate also in warfare. Warfare is endemic to humans. By the way, and this is very interesting, humans really are the only uh, vertebrates, certainly the only mammals, that, that have wars, in the sense of two sides, equal, perhaps somewhat equal, come together and they fight it out to see who wins. Chimps do not do that. They can pick on individuals in another troop, but they don't have sustained uh, warfare. Ants have sustained warfare, but they're not vertebrates. So this is a, but we've had that and been very good at it. If you look at the evidence on, you know, how people died in the past, plenty of heads split open right down the middle, and bones fractured um, in ways like in the forearm. If, if there's a bone fracture in the forearm, they know that you were putting up a fight. You put up your forearm and someone smacked it. So you can tell. Uh, from the uh, bones, how they were. Also, they need truthfully transmitted information in order to coordinate behaviors and cooperate with life. So these have significant advantages over other groups, and therefore they proliferate. Um, okay. Humans devise ways to protect their altruistic members from explo exploitation by the self-interested. This is what we call al al altruistic punishment or strong reciprocity. People spontaneously like to hurt people who hurt the group. Um, shunning, ostracism, and even execution. And if you read Hierarchy in the Jungle by uh, Chris Bohm or his more recent book, it goes through in detail the conditions under which people, usually young men, are ostracized or killed simply because they're bullies. They want to take over, they kill. And one night, someone just puts a knife, uh, knife in them. Um, 
Okay. Uh, the second thing humans did that we talked about is incredibly interesting. They, they adopted prolonged and elaborate systems of socialization. Programmable preferences. Humans are the only species that have programmable preferences. That is, they're, they're not, it's not, for other animals, they have to learn. They learn how to hunt. And they learn um, snake, how to avoid snakes, what foods to eat. They learn stuff. But their preferences are pretty much wired in. Humans, you can teach totally different, totally different preferences. Food preferences, how to talk, um, norms, ethics. Um, so you can make a very flexible species. It can adapt rapidly to new situations simply by how you, ch you change the way you raise your kids. Um, and these are called internalization of norms. So people, the idea is norms are not conventions and they're not constraints. They're right in your, they're right in your preference function. They're things that you're trying to get. They're goods. They're not constraints. Um, okay. Third, between group competition for resources was a decisive force in human evolutionary dynamics. The reason humans are so cooperative is that they fight with each other all the time. And the ones that are more cooperative fight more and better. And they beat the ones who are less cooperative. So, you know, I love this because I hate to be a goody goody. I've always hated to be a good. Co cooperation is really good. How does it happen? It happens through competition and we're killing people. Whoever kills better is going to have the more cooperative people. Okay? That's nice. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's true, which is why we say it, but it's one of these gifts of having to, you know, having to work out nicely. Um, okay, so, as we argue, throughout history, group extinction, costly group dispersal, and dispersal and ostracism have been powerful mechanisms supporting the evolution of human cooperation. Now, don't get me wrong. If you go back into our prehistory, there's huge amounts of cooperation across groups. We know this absolutely because, for instance, the same a rock or a metal or a wood type that, uh, that only occurs in one place will be seen 500 meters away, uh, five, uh, 100 kilometers away. They trade, trade was very extensive in human society. It did not exist in any other species. So we're both very cooperative and very um, willing to uh, be violent. Um, okay. Now, When I usually give this talk, I then go through all of these experiments that we've been talking about. Public goods games, this and that, we set the list, but I'm not going to do that here, obviously. Um, so I'll just go on. I, I actually, uh, I love to do the one on honesty. This is a study by um, Mesey, 2005. Please read it if you don't know it. It's absolutely beautiful. On how much people are willing to pay, to be honest. No, it's just simply not to tell the truth. They're willing to lose money. Nobody knows but them. By the way, whenever ever you say anonymity in a game, it's never anonymous. You always know what you did. At the end of the experiment, you know what you did. Now, you may say, well, why don't we do an experiment where we tell people we're going to block, block their mind completely so they'll never remember what they did? Well, I don't know what they would do. They was probably wouldn't. That was the 60s you mentioned earlier. Right? Yes, <laughs> perhaps something like that. We often would wake up in the morning and say, where am I? What place is this? Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to go through this because um, it works well. The most beautiful part of it is that almost everyone is somewhat honest. But if you make the cost of being honest high enough, they stop being honest. So it's just like a trade-off. It's in your honesty is in your preference function. You trade it off against other things. No one is honest. Well, I never met anybody, and I've never heard of things. But just honest, no matter what. So I'll get off of that. People make trade-offs. Morali morality is not categorical. It's a, it's a fun, it's something we like to do, but you know, push comes to shove, we don't always do it. Okay. 
Parochial altruism. Now I want to talk about the interaction between uh, um, competition and um, cooperation. Altruism, conferring benefits on others. Parochialism, favoring ethnic, racial, or other insiders over outsiders. Now you realize humans do this. There is no other species that does this. Uh, no other vertebrate species. Ants do it. Bees do. In other words, if you put a strange ant into an anthill, they get swarmed and killed. Because they have pheromones, they know who, who belongs and who doesn't. But other than that, dogs, you know, do you think dogs care whether you're a Shetland or a German Shepherd or a what? They don't care. They mate with anybody. They hate each other no matter what. They love each other no matter what. There's no races. There's no ethnic group. But humans, there are. It's a very strong human behavior. And by the way, some people say, well, you we should never take that. That's bad, evil. Well, so, you know, that's the way people are. You can try to make it unimportant in your life or etc. cetera, but it's, it's one of the natural feelings that humans have. We're insider favorites. A common behavior, in-group in, in favoritism. Now, the question is, both in-group favoritism and altruism are costly. Because if you favor the in-group, well, then you're expending resources that you would not have to if you just treated everybody equally. And altruism is the same. So they're both um, fitness, uh, fitness um, penalizing fitness. They reduce fitness. And therefore, they should not evolve. But what about if you put them together? Should they then evolve? And that's what we show in our book, um, that if you have a society that has parochial altruistic behavior, it can then contribute to the success of between-group hostilities. Neither altruism nor parochialism alone is, is likely to evolve. But if you put them together, they can evolve. And we show that analytically. We show it with agent-based models, and we use a huge amount of data because it does depend on the amount of genetic uh, relatedness of populations. So um, that's what I'm not going to do this because I don't have time. What do I have? Two more minutes or something? Five. All right. Um, that's why other regarding preferences are often conditional on group members. That is, you only help people in your group. By the way, there are many societies where you are, you are, um, uh, you are thought ill if you help people outside the group. You only help people inside the group. Um, but was war sufficiently common and lethal to allow the pro proliferation of an altruistic trait linked to a parochial trait? Because here, altruistic parochialism is simple. This guy goes out there and gets his head shot off because he's altruistic on behalf of the group that he's in, because he is parochial. The parochial altruist is the universal soldier who's always getting killed in all these wars. And by the way, if he weren't parochial, he would be altruistic toward the whole world. He wouldn't want to fight his enemy, you know. Uh, there's a great Yates poem about what the hell am I doing up here in the sky fighting somebody I never heard of, you know. Um, so you have to have both of them, um, and then I'm not. I don't have time to go through, you know, what you have to do in academia. You get a lot of a lot of Greek letters and string them together in different ways and uh, prove something. So that what we find is. If two kappa BR is greater than C, <laughs> rah, we go out and do it. Thank you. Uh, where, kappa, where kappa is the um, rate of intergroup rivalry, R is the um, genetic, uh, genetic relatedness, B is the gain from winning, and C is the cost of losing. If you know Hamilton's rule in biology, it's Hamilton's rule with the two kappa in the front. Um, and what Sam Bowles did, not me, 
Because he went to all these, he got data from all these places. The black, uh, or they're not really dots, the black squares uh, and dots are evidence of mortality, and the white dots are genetic differentiation. So you get relatedness on the one hand, and you get benefits and costs on the other. Um, and you make these, you know, huge um, uh, tables with relatedness coefficients and uh, uh, so-called F, um, rights F statistic, which is the degree of relatedness within a group. Um, and you show that, in fact, for reasonable numbers, um, you can have a C star, which is a minimum cost, I'm sorry, a maximum cost of conflict that uh, is still um, makes it rational for uh, an agent who is um, parochial uh, and altruistic to engage in conflict. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll, I won't go through all of these um, uh, details, but I'll say in, in very quickly the main point that's going on is Within a group, altruists lose because the, the free riders do better than they do. But across groups, those groups that have lots of altruists do better than the groups that have a few. And if you put those together, it's something called Price's equation. Price is the name of a man, not, not economics. <laughs> Price's equation shows how these two terms relate to each other. And altruism evolves when um, the within-group losses of the altruists are more than offset by the between-group gains. That is, the groups with lots of altruists do better and they, uh, and they supplant the ones with less. So that's, this is classic group selection theory in, uh, in biology, although, in fact, I deny that there's any, any conflict between this and, and uh, individual selection or gene-level selection or anything. I, it's just a controversy over nothing. Um, so I think, yes, OK, if you simulate it, you get a distribution like this, in which there's one equilibrium. The reason why it's, it's an equilibrium, because it's an equilibrium, even though it's not, um, I'm sorry, it's an equilibrium because um, there's a lot of, of um, random stochastic behavior, so it's not zero, one, it's not bang, bang. So you see there's one equilibrium towards 0, 0, and another towards 1, 1. That is no, there's no uh, altruists, no parochials, or there are lots of altruists and lots of parochials. Those are the two equilibria. Um, okay, that's it. We still have no evidence of a genetic basis for war, altruism, or parochialism in humans. This is all airy fairy tale. We do not know that there's a gene, gene, gene for altruism. In fact, it's very hard to find single genes for anything except these horrible diseases, you know, BRAC3 or something. So this is all talk until we actually get the genetic basis for this. Thank you.